Luke chapter 3 this morning. Uh, we have moved back into the gospel of Luke and we'll be tracking in Luke for a while now. Uh, this morning we come to the baptism, to the baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus. We have seen uh, John the Baptist ministry uh, coming on preaching uh, a baptism for the re repentance uh, and forgiveness of sins. And now Jesus comes on the scene to be baptized. And I think we have uh, incorrectly presented Jesus' baptism as, as the model for Christian baptism. But Jesus' baptism, while obviously clearly a similar in experience to what we experience, was not at all like ours in a specific single way that we'll see in just a minute. So I want to clarify some of that. But look at how God was working in the baptism of his son and how that speaks to us this morning in 2023 in metro Atlanta. Let's look at Luke chapter 3 beginning with verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the Son, so it was thought, of Joseph. Luke is reminding us of what we've already read, if you think back to Luke chapter 1 and 2, that Joseph was Jesus' earthly father, but he was not the originator in terms of Jesus' conception. That was done by the Heavenly Father through the Spirit of God in Mary. So it was thought of Joseph, the son of Heli, and then it goes on to a genealogy all the way down to chapter or to verse 38, I'm sorry, that says, and this is significant, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. We'll come back and look at that in a minute. But I just want to start out um, with a question. Well, why is it if, if John came preaching and baptizing, calling people to a repentance for the forgiveness of sins, why is it that Jesus, who was without sin, is baptized? Why is it that he needs to be baptized? And I think, again, there's some confusion. Often um, we'll hear it talked about as if John the Baptist understood everything about Jesus already and we'll, we'll reach back if you're familiar with your Bible to Matthew 3 where Matthew says that John tried to deter Jesus from being baptized and said uh, I need you to baptize me not me baptize you but the interesting thing is that in John chapter 1 John the Baptist says himself now John the Baptist didn't write the gospel of John but John the Apostle is recording John the Baptist's words in John chapter 1 verse 31 where he says that he didn't, he didn't know Jesus. And he doesn't mean there that he didn't know him at all. What he's saying there is that he didn't know Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. John the Baptist hadn't put all the pieces of the puzzle, as it were, together yet. He didn't understand Jesus of Nazareth as Jesus the Christ. Called for, predicted for in the Old Testament, waited on by his people. So there was something missing, but there was something about Jesus, something about his life maybe, something about maybe the way that he lived. John the Baptist doesn't clarify for us. He just makes clear in John chapter 1 verse 31 that he didn't, he didn't know Jesus as the Messiah yet when he came to be baptized. But there was something about Jesus that was different than everyone else that caused John the Baptist to hesitate. And part of what's happening in Matthew chapter 3, as Matthew is crafting his gospel and putting it together uniquely under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, as each of the gospel writers did, is he's pointing forward in his language to the ultimate baptism of Jesus on the cross in his death, as Jesus liked to refer 
to his crucifixion. And what you see in John the Baptist is this idea that you don't need to be here experiencing this. I need to be here experiencing this at your hand. Pointing toward the cross, and if you'll remember a conversation loosely between uh, two criminals on either side of Jesus, where one of them says something along the same lines. We deserve to be here as he's in conversation with his fellow criminal. He doesn't deserve to be here. And so you've got, in a sense, in Jesus' baptism, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, a foreshadowing of Jesus' ultimate act of obedience before the Father in his crucifixion. So why is it that Jesus is baptized? Because if you look at it, there's not really made much, there's not really much made of Jesus' actual baptism. Look again at the words in verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. That's rather anticlimactic, isn't it? When everybody else was coming out and being immersed in the Jordan, Jesus was immersed also. But what we find here is that Jesus is identified with sinners. Jesus is having himself be intentionally identified with sinners and with the experience of sinners. And if you are at all self-aware, this should be good news for you this morning. That Jesus is identified with sinners sinners. Jesus there as a participant in collectively what was going on in Israel and with the people of Israel at this time who had again and again and again fallen short of God's standard and call in their life comes simply in the process and in the line. Some of you who've flown, if you can picture this baptism line, it's sort of like standing in line at security. You move a few steps and you wait. John the Baptist would say a couple of words. Down someone would go and out they'd come and you'd move a couple of more steps. John would say a few more words. Down someone would go and back up, hopefully, and out they would come. And you'd move a few more steps. It's like the security line. And this is what's going on. And Jesus is just another first century Jewish Palestinian in line waiting to be baptized but something unique is going on because when Jesus is baptized he's not just identified with sinners but his identity is clarified his identity is clarified look at where really the the substance the bulk in all the gospel accounts of Jesus baptism lies it's in what happened when Jesus was baptized or immediately following after, depending on how the gospel writers wrote it. And as he was praying, as he was praying, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love and with you I am well pleased. Now, let me point out something that that you need to know and you need to understand as you approach the Bible and you read it for yourself and you seek to hear God's voice in it and to be transformed. The baptism account here in Luke differs from the other Gospels. And if you read all three of them and read them carefully, you'll notice that they all three differ. Mark's account uh, is a more private experience. As Mark accounts Jesus' baptism, Jesus sees heaven open and hears the voice of God the Father speaking directly to him. It seems to be Jesus alone in Mark's gospel that hears the voice. Matthew's gospel is a little more vague. It's a little more ambiguous. Heaven is just simply opened. Heaven simply opens. And the voice speaks about Jesus in the third person. Luke's account maintains Uh, A second person addressed to Jesus, but his description of the Spirit coming in bodily form is given as something that that everyone around Jesus can see. And in John chapter 1, verse 32, John the Baptist says he sees the Spirit come down in bodily form. Here's why it's important. 
Here's why it's important. It's important for you and I as we're maturing and understanding the gift of the scriptures that we have before us as God's gift to us, that it is sufficient and authoritative and exactly what God intends us to have. And yet to mature in our understanding of it means to accept it as a book authored ultimately by God through the agency of human personalities for specific reasons. So you're going to get uh, three different accounts of, of Jesus' baptism, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and each one is a little bit different. And mature, being mature in Christ and mature in our understanding of the Bible means that we understand that they're a little bit different because Matthew was crafting his in a certain way as he was building a certain argument in one direction. And Mark was doing the same thing, and Luke was doing the same thing. And every biographer in history has done exactly the same thing. They take an account, they take eyewitnesses' account, they research it, they write it, they take what they saw, they compare it to what other people saw, and they craft it together in a way that's accurate, but in a way that is reflective of the message they're trying to put out. Does that make sense? So if you read them and you're thoughtful, like if you read Genesis 1 and 2, you're going to go, there's some things that are in different orders. What does that mean? And so sometimes we get defensive when we run around kind of in a childish way talking about the Bible as if God didn't allow for and indeed choose to use human personality and circumstances, situation and culture to bring about his authoritative, sufficient, trustworthy scriptures. But he did. So I want us to be mature as we approach the Bible, understanding that the, disp- the different gospel writers put different events in Jesus' life at different times. Sometimes some things are missing from one gospel writer that are included in another, and a thoughtful person, a thinking person, which sometimes really excludes a lot of people, but a thinking person is going to say, well, why is that? Well, it, for the same reason that it is true of every other thing that's ever been written. Because the Spirit was guiding them to write for specific reasons to specific groups, crafting the narrative of Jesus' life in a specific way. And here we have it also with his baptism. But I want you to note what Luke says here. He says that as Jesus was praying, note the connection there of prayer with baptism. Not not the prayer of the one officiating the baptism, but the prayer of the one being baptized. Again and again and again in Scripture, it is while the people of God are praying that God does powerful things. Reading one a commentator who is uh, long since passed away, who, who pastored and wrote in his day, and his church said, perhaps, and he was writing in his day, And it was uh, amazing how resoundingly true it is in our day. He said, perhaps the reason that we see so little fruit following most of the baptisms is that there's so little prayer involved in baptism. But it's while Jesus is praying that two significant things happen. Heaven is opened, first of all. And if you'll remember at Jesus' crucifixion, the tearing of the veil. And in in Matthew's uh, gospel, it's this picture, and in Luke, of heaven being torn open and the voice of God coming out. The same picture that's used for the veil. As Christ is crucified, uh, the the distance and the the closed-off nature of human beings from God is made obsolete in Christ. The barrier is overcome in Christ. Heaven was opened. The second thing that happens is the Holy Spirit descends on him in bodily form. This is important because most of the time when we think about this, we picture like a dove just sort of comes down and lands on Jesus. Well, that's not what the gospel writers are saying. The gospel writers are saying the third person in the Trinity descended in a bodily form. Bodily is not used to speak of animals. The way in which the descent happened was the same way that a dove comes and lands. Are you with me? A very common occurrence. It would have created an immediate picture. 
Doves are very common in the ancient Near East. But the Holy Spirit comes in bodily form on Jesus at his baptism. And here you see the triune nature of God. You see the Trinitarian God at work for you and for me. You see the full agency of the Godhead engaged here at Jesus' baptism. You see God the Father speaking. You see God the Son in the water. You see God the Spirit descending. It's a powerful picture and a great uh, statement against one of the early church heresies called modalism. Don't get worked up now, but modalism was just the idea that there's really just one God, but he existed across human time in three different modes. And the Council of Nicaea slapped that down and said, no, that's, that's heresy. Uh, so modalists, simply speaking, would say, well, God in the Old Testament revealed himself as Father. Uh, God in the New Testament from Bethlehem to the Ascension reveals himself as Son. And from the Ascension on now, God reveals himself as Spirit. And the Council of Nicaea said, no, that detracts from the fullness of what scripture, scripture says about the triune nature of God. That in the Godhead, you have the three persons, one nature of God, one person, three natures, co-equal, co-eternal. And here you see, it's not successively that God reveals himself, but simultaneously. This one event, all of God is present, and he's present in Christ at his baptism, showing his power for your redemption and for mine. J.C. Ryle puts it this way, how mighty and powerful is the agency that is employed in the great business of our redemption. All three persons in the Godhead are equally concerned in the deliverance of our souls from hell. The enemies of our souls are mighty. And they are. Would you not agree? Your your own battle with yourself and your own sin is mighty. As well as the grasp of sinful forces outside of you and of spirits. The enemies of our souls are mighty, but the friends of our souls are mightier still. And Ryle's just reminding us that it is the entire Godhead that's engaged in our redemptive process and if you look at jesus baptism you you've got to note if you're familiar with your bibles genesis 1 let me just point out some things to you real quick so in the beginning of john john chapter 1 john says in the beginning was what do you remember the word yeah in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god and john goes on to say the word the logos is jesus it's jesus if you remember in genesis 1 God the Father creates by his word through his spirit. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Verse 3, And God said, And then by God's word he creates everything that is. And in Jesus Christ, baptism you see the same triune god at work you see god the father speaking you see god the son again in the water you see god the spirit again hovering over the waters descending on the sun you have creation and you have this picture of the full Godhead at work in new creation, beginning with Jesus' ministry launch at the moment of his baptism. At the moment of his baptism. His identity is clarified here. The Father says, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And 
Here you find language ripped from Isaiah and Psalms and other places in the Old Testament signifying Jesus. This one man in this seemingly long random line of individuals being baptized one after another after another after another in the Jordan River. All of a sudden at his baptism as he's praying something happens once in human history. It is not repeatable. It's not the same as my baptism or your baptism. God the Father declares as heaven opens and the Spirit descends in bodily form that Jesus is his Son. He's the one the world has been waiting on. Jesus' identity is clarified. Jesus' identity is also illustrated in a genealogy. Now, you and I don't think much of genealogies, right? I mean, how many of you have ever just gotten really fired up about reading gene genealogies in the Bible. Anybody, anybody that's just like, that's your jam? Uh, a good devotional morning for you is just going genealogy after genealogy? Um, it, it's not, but it was interesting. I was able to, to run across some of the writing from commentators in, in parts of the developing world where genealogies are still a huge part um, of their culture. It's a big deal to know where someone came from because that tells you what they're qualified for in their society or culture or what their, what their status is. I was thinking about this this week. If you look simply at verse 23 and 24. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Not 30, about 30, right? About 30 when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph. And if I looked at this right, in two verses you get to Jesus' great, 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 great grandfather. Do any of you know the name of your great, 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 great grandfather? I don't know the name of any of my great grandfathers. Now I do know my grandfather's. And with my memory with people's names, I count that as quite an achievement. But you get two verses in, and you're five generations back. And I just want to say again here, for our maturing and how we understand the great gift of the Bible as exactly what God intends us to have in our day, is that Luke's gene genealogy is substantially different than Matthew's genealogy. Matthew writes his genealogy in, in Matthew 1 of Jesus, and it's very different. Then Luke's, I won't go into the differences and bore you, but sometime if you just want a really spicy afternoon, um, write out both those genealogies and compare them. They're, they're distinctly different. It's not that one, one is true and one is not true. It's that Matthew tracks it in a certain way and Luke tracks it in a different way. Matthew takes his focus on the royal throne succession. He follows the Old Testament list of kings of Judah down to the exile and Luke traces it through Joseph's ancestry, not through Solomon the king, but through another son of David. Again, they were making specific points with their genealogies based on the gospels that they were writing about Jesus' life. But if you look at this genealogy, what's most interesting and why I, I skipped all the verses in the middle and went to verse 38 is verse 38. Nowhere else in Scripture is the genealogy of Jesus traced all the way back to God the Father himself. Verse 38, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Now why does Luke do this? I mean, that's a pretty thorough genealogy, is it not? To trace Jesus all the way back to Adam, the son of of God he does it to show both Jesus solidarity with the entire human race that Jesus stands alongside us in our stead as one who experienced all that we experience and yet remained obedient perfectly obedient to the father thus enabling him to be our substitutionary atoning sacrifice the one who was able, as a human being, to atone for your sin and mine. But also, 
showing his status as the unique, unique son of God. All the way back to God himself. Part of what, what Luke is doing here in a brilliant way is what Paul kind of expounds on uh, in Genesis 5. is showing that, that all of us are either, in a sense, sons of God through Christ, redeemed, part of God's new creation and new people, or sons of Adam, still under the curse of sin, still enslaved to sin, still moving toward the ultimate consequences of sin and guilt. Luke tracks Jesus all the way back. Let me read to you a passage from Romans 5. Romans 5, beginning with verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Paul's talking about the universality of sin and death here. To be sure, or for sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command. Because the commandments, uh, the Ten Commandments given um, to the people through Moses hadn't been given yet. As did Adam, who is a pattern, a pattern of the one to come but the gift is not like the trespass for if the many died by the trespass of the one man how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace of the one man Jesus Christ overflow to the many nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Now, I'm not going to go deep into this because I know that you all understand all of that already. And there's no need to even discuss it. But what Paul is doing here is distinctly casting the reality of Christ as the second Adam, yet the faithful one. The one who didn't disobey. The one who fulfilled all the righteous standards and commands of God. And this is what Luke is doing. Luke is tracing Jesus' lineage all the way back to Adam, the Son of God, painting Jesus, in a sense, as the second Adam, the faithful one who fulfilled what Adam did not and Israel could not. New Testament professor and commentator David Garland says this about the genealogy when talking about why, why should we care? Why do we care about genealogies? In fact, I'll say this. I, when I grew up, there was still such a thing as a family reunion. Any of you remember those things? Like a bunch of people you were related to, but you didn't really know. But you were told you were related to them. And you were supposed to have a bunch of, uh, a bunch of feelings for them. Uh, but they were just odd people that you saw every couple of years. Who, if you were a kid, would sometimes tell you random stories with bad breath that you didn't want to hear. And everyone would bring their favorite dishes, some of which were great, some of which were terrible. But you weren't free to say, who brought this thing? This should never be brought again. Right? Because you would deeply wound someone. So I had family reunions, a couple of them that we attended. Over the years, though, they just sort of faded out. Anybody with me? Anybody used to experience some family reunions in your family, and now they faded out? Thank goodness. No, I don't know. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's some benefit. Uh, older cousins who used to know each other can kind of catch up and uh, compare lives and see who's more successful. But, um, but we're, just, we're just not a culture. We're an extremely mobile culture now. Families are spread all over the place. Plus, you can just text one another or, or FaceTime if you want to. I don't know what's happened, but we don't, we don't have a value for that as ancient cultures did and even uh, cultures in the developing world do today. So Garland writes about genealogies, and he said, Luke's genealogy reminds us that God keeps his promises. And it demonstrates God's providence across the ages directing the traffic 
of history. I love that phrase. God's providence across the ages, directing the traffic of history to the climactic birth of Jesus. Some of you will be unfamiliar with the word providence. Some of you will be familiar with it. If you've been through the Elam Institute classes, you should know providence. Providence is, is a manifestation of God's sovereignty. It's God's both ability and desire to guide the course of human history toward his good and perfect end for it. And Garland is rightly observing that when we see a genealogy of this, like this, we're reminded that God is indeed able and pleased to direct, as he says, the traffic of history. Not only to the climactic birth of Jesus, but to its climactic good end in the sovereign will of God. Anybody in here need to, to be reminded this morning that God is indeed faithful? That even though he hasn't answered some of your prayers, and if you pray very much at all, there'll be some that go unanswered. There are some people that you pray for healing for, and they're not healed. There are going to be some that you pray for diligently to come to faith in Christ. And at least to your knowledge and awareness, that isn't happening. There are going to be some desires in you. Both some that you pray to be relieved of, that God may not relieve you of, but he'll give you the grace and the strength to walk in obedience, even with that desire in your life. Or maybe some desires to see something come about in your life that, are good, that is good and right and just and you, even you believe God has given it to you. And yet, even as you believe he's given it to you and you feel like you're praying in line with God's will and his, uh, his wiring for you, he just hasn't answered yet. Maybe for some of you, you, you had a very clear picture of how you thought your life was going to go, and that's not at all how it's gone. And there's a part of you that grieves that. And you need to be reminded by something as simple as a genealogy that God does indeed know what he's doing. And that through the, the ordinary course of human life, using ordinary human beings, because can I just tell you, that's the only kind of human beings that exist, just ordinary people. Ordinary men and women. God is nevertheless pleased to use ordinary men and women in the ordinary circumstances of life to forward his good and beautiful and perfect will for this world and your life. And some of you need to be reminded of that this morning because things simply aren't going like you thought they were going to go. God is still in control. He is still the one that is directing the traffic of history and directing the traffic of your own life. And he's good. And he desires nothing but good for you. I want to go back to J.C. Ryle. One of the things that he notes here is just the simple human aspect we talked about how uh, the, in the genealogy, Luke shows Jesus' solidarity with the human race, all of the human race, so it doesn't matter your education level or your race or your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your financial status. It doesn't matter your age or your gender. Jesus stands in solidarity with the entire human race. And the genealogy reveals Jesus' unique status as the son of God yet on the human level Ryle notes this about the people listed in the genealogy they had their own sorrows and joys their hopes and fears their cares and troubles their schemes and plans like any of us I think we forget this sometimes I think we forget that the names listed here were real human beings who lived in real places at real times in human history trying to figure things out 
before the watchful eye of a sovereign God just as you and I do. Yet, they lived on the backside of Christ. Didn't have the blessing of living on the side that we live on. But, Ryle says, they have all passed away from the earth and gone to their own place. And so will it be with us. We too are passing away and shall soon be gone forever. That's true of all of us. It doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter how young you are. Like, the youngest person in here, I could tell you, hey, um, look, I'm the same as you. I just have lived a few more seasons, right? So if, if you think of life as a, a TV show, I could give you some spoilers about what's coming. Right? There's going to be a day, because right now you go to the doctor and you're in and out. There's going to be, the, be a day you go to the doctor and he says, hey, shut the door. You're like, what? Let's talk about your diet. Now, you never had to talk about diet before, right? There's going to be a day when you wake up and, as I've said before, you threw something out while you were sleeping. That doesn't happen when you're young. But as you get some tenure, you'll find that you can actually injure yourself in bed while sleeping. You get your hair cut right now, let's say guys, like you're in and out. There's going to be a time where you sit down and the person cutting your hair says, do you want me to trim your ears too? And you go, I, I didn't know I had things growing out of them. But please do. I don't want to look like a monkey. I remember distinctly the first time I was sitting in a chair and the lady said, would you like me to trim your eyebrows? I was like, what? No one's ever asked that before. Are they out of control? You know? I was like, hand me a mirror. Strange things happen as you age. You look at your body and it looks normal one day. And then it doesn't. And you get spots in places. You don't know why they're there or where they came from. I didn't used to have a dye pattern on my arm, but now I do. I don't know, little spots coming up. Things happen. Things happen. I had a pastor friend of mine text me this week and say, I got to tell you guys, we have to hold one another accountable to stay clothed in the gym locker room as we get older. Because he said, I just left the YMCA and the only people who feel free to walk around in there as God created them seem to be over 65. And he said, I got to tell you, some terrible things are going to happen to us in the next couple of decades. But Ryle is right. All of us in the end are going in the ground. And we don't know whether that's today or tomorrow or next year. Can I plead with you this morning? If you know Jesus intellectually, if you know some things about him, if you know the church world and you can navigate it, if you know your family has a heritage of faith, but you're yet to bow your head and your heart to him in submissive repentance, agreeing with God the Father that you are indeed a sinner, separated from him now by a barrier erected by your own sinfulness, And throwing yourself on his mercy in the name of Christ. If you've never done that, don't keep putting it off. Maybe today is the day appointed for your salvation. And the next time we do baptism here, you need to be one down here. Following, if not in like kind, the example of Jesus in an act of obedience. Don't put it off. Say yes as the Spirit of God opens your heart. If you do that, everything in your life changes. It doesn't mean you're going to have an easy one. 
but it does mean that God's presence and power comes to live in you through the person and work of his spirit. It means that you've been united to him, forgiven of all your sin, past, present, and future. And we want to know about it. We want to know about it so we can walk with you as you take your first steps as a disciple of Jesus. Let me ask you to stand this morning. For those of you who have already responded in that way and know yourselves by God's mercy to be baptized believers, in just a few minutes, you're going to have an opportunity to participate in communion. Right now, wherever we are, God moves and stirs in your life as we prepare to give back to Him. Giving to God is simply an act of worship. Church, it's a declaration of trust in Him. It's a tangible way to say, God, I believe what you told me, that you are my ultimate provider and sustainer. And as we say week by week, and try to remind you that on the other end of your giving, always change lives let me pray for us and as I pray our offering ushers are going to make their way to their positions you guys can remain standing I guess since I stood you before we did offering you might have to reach down and grab something Uh, but as I'm praying uh, feel free to do that and as those buckets come by drop in your giving envelope your connection card let me pray for us Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you have brought to bear your entire triune nature, Father, Son, and Spirit, in the act of our redemption. God, thank you that you bring all of who you are to all of who we are, healing us. God, that you you offer in your fullness and your wholeness, hope for our brokenness. God, as we prepare to give back just uh, such a small amount of all that you give to us, Father, I pray that you would receive it with gladness and delight, God. Lord, we give as an act of worship. We give because we need to declare our trust in you and walk in obedience in you. God, we give that we might participate in your gospel work on earth. Father, I pray for all who are about to give and all who've given throughout the week. God, remind us that every time we give, however we give, to you through your local church, it is a sacred thing. God, may your blessing be on those who honor you and support your work. I pray in Christ's name.